Hey friends, thanks for joining. Welcome to Breville's Masterclass for how to dial in the Barista Pro. I'm Matt Davis, product expert for Coffee with Breville. If you're tuning in for the live chat, feel free to ask questions throughout the class. We have a team of experts from Breville that are ready to answer your questions. If you're watching the on-demand version, feel free to email your questions to brevillebarista at brevillusa.com. I'm so excited to be here. Let's make some coffee. Now, as I have right here is the Barista Pro, and you'll notice, aside from all of our other products, this has a completely different user interface. We have an LCD screen and then a couple buttons. So the point of this class is to make sure that when we approach the machine, we understand all those different components first step, last step, and just have a really nice clean workflow from beginning to finish making a coffee. Now, as you probably learned by now, nothing about making espresso is really intuitive, and that's kind of unfortunate, uh, but hopefully we can give you enough context so that you feel really confident to make all the necessary changes anytime something goes awry, and then feel really comfortable all week long making a great cup of coffee. So before we begin, we need to add some coffee. So we're gonna load up this hopper. I'm gonna grab some fresh whole bean coffee. I'm using a vacuum canister. This is a great way to keep your coffee fresh. What it does is it makes sure that any extra oxygen is pushed out to try to keep as much of the CO2 in contact with the coffee. So as soon as you roast coffee, CO2 starts to rapidly dissipate. And CO2 is kind of like the life force of coffee. So when we think about coffee freshness, all we're really talking about is how much of that CO2 is still there. Now, when you're shopping for coffee, you'll notice a couple different iterations of a date, right? You have a roast date, a best buy date, maybe even an expiration date. Now, there is a difference. So what we really wanna look for is a bag of coffee that tells us when the coffee was roasted because that's gonna give us the most insight as to how fresh that coffee is. So looking for a roast date within 30 days is gonna give you the best bang for your buck. Now, anything else is not necessarily bad coffee. It just means we have little insight as to how much CO2 is in that coffee, and that could just make our job making the coffee taste good a little bit more difficult. So now that the hopper is full, we are ready to start the first process here, which is going to be grinding our coffee. Now, let's understand some key components outside of the machine itself. So when you get your machine, you'll also receive a couple different accessories. Now, all of those accessories will be nice and tidy kept away in our accessories bin. And there's only a few that I really wanna focus on today, which is the baskets and then the razor trimming tool. All the other ones are gonna be really helpful for cleaning, but that's a whole nother masterclass. It's really straightforward. The machine's really easy to take care of. But today let's focus on understanding these accessories, when you'll need to use them and how to use them and maybe even why. So you'll receive a couple different baskets, four in total, that's a lot. Now the reason for that is twofold. So you have two different size baskets, as you'll notice, like really straightforward. One, you can hold more or less coffee, okay? But then you also have two different styles of baskets. I like to use the edge of a basket to actually remove the one from the portafilter just by using some leverage here. So we can just pop that open using the lip Makes that job a lot easier. Gonna give this a quick little wipe down. And then let's understand visually the difference between these two baskets that seemingly are the same size. So what's the actual difference? Well, they're both double or two cup baskets. When you look down in the middle of them from the top down, they look exactly the same. Bunch of little holes at them, right? The real difference is actually on the back side. When we flip them over, you'll notice that the same holes exist straight through on the single wall basket. But then on the other one, this is called a dual wall basket or a pressurized basket. You'll notice that there's an additional layer on the other side. And what that is doing is it's, it's forcing all of the water through only one hole instead of all the little individual ones, right? So what that's doing is engineering back pressure because our job as the barista the home barista in this case is we're trying to control water flow right espresso is essentially just a brew method where you're forcing water instead of letting gravity do the work 
So using a pump, we're forcing water through a small amount of coffee, and if that water finds a path of least resistance, well, it's going to go that way, and then you're going to end up with uneven extraction. So we need to make sure that the water stays with the coffee an appropriate amount of time. So if you're using the single wall basket where you have all these little holes, if your grind size isn't just right, that water is gonna flow through too quickly. So a really great scenario where you might wanna use the pressurized basket is when you're using coffee that's pre-ground. So let's say you have your favorite coffee loaded in your hopper, ready to go, but then, you know, late at night, you want a cappuccino, but you don't wanna have to redial in, so you switch to a pre-ground decaf. You could simply use your pressurized basket, and what that's going to do is bypass the fact that that pre-ground coffee might not be the exact grind size that you need, and it will ensure that the water stays held back with the coffee long enough for it to taste, well, acceptable. It's never going to be perfect. It doesn't fix all the problems, but it does allow you some flexibility should you want to use pre-ground coffee. Another great scenario is if you don't know the freshness of your coffee, or let's just say that your coffee has started to degas and maybe you went out of town or maybe you're just starting to work through it really slowly and you've noticed that the water is acting different with the coffee because it started to get a little old. Well, by switching to the pressurized basket, because you don't have as much CO2 to help carry flavor components, it's actually easier for the water to just pass straight through that coffee. So you're gonna have that same issue where you don't have enough resistance. So the pressurized basket, once again, for coffee that's a little bit outside of that fresh sweetness zone, uh, will just help you kind of retain as much flavor as possible. That's the best way to look at it. So both of these baskets get the job done. The single wall, holes on both sides, great for really fresh whole bean coffee. And the pressurized, feel free to use it in a couple different scenarios, mostly pre-ground coffee or coffee that's gone a little bit towards the stale side of things. Now, again, coffee within 30 days freshness, that's kind of the spot where you're going to really get what you pay for. It's the, it's the way that I like to look at it. Because coffee doesn't necessarily expire. But once all that CO2 is gone, you're kind of missing your opportunity to pull out what it has to offer. So let's try to find some really nice fresh coffee. And then I implore you to explore coffee, try different coffees. You've probably been drinking the same coffee for a really long time and that's totally fine. I fall into that rhythm as well. Uh, but there's so many different coffees out there. Uh, it can be really exciting to try something new. So don't be afraid to switch it up. Any coffee can be used as espresso. It doesn't have to be an espresso roast, an espresso blend. Just know that coffees on the medium to dark roast profile are going to be the most forgiving when it comes to espresso. All right, let's dive in. I'm gonna put these baskets back in our handy dandy accessories bin. Boop. And now let's talk about like the real practical stuff here. I have a couple of accessories and things that I like to put in my workflow to make the whole process really easy and streamlined. And just know that when I approach the espresso machine, my goal is to create consistency. It's gonna make my life easier and I can do it when I'm half asleep at 6 a.m. or whatever time you're making coffee. Now, we have our porta filter basket set up so I can go ahead and just put that aside. I also like to have two washcloths. You can use dish towels, whatever. Whether they're disposable or not, I like to use reusable, uh, but you know, whatever you have, one of them I keep on me and it's gonna be dry. I'm gonna use that for cleaning my portafilter. I always wanna make sure that this is dry and clean of coffee grinds. I'm then gonna have another washcloth that I'm going to get a little bit damp and I can just use the shower head, the group head here, to get it just a slightly damp and I'm gonna use that for actually washing and wiping my steam wand. You wanna make sure that you wipe your steam wand as soon as you're done steaming. And this is just, again, working in little rhythms that we can to kind of take preventative maintenance and make it something that just happens naturally instead of having to remember. So if we're building in a workflow that includes preventative maintenance and cleaning, your machine's gonna be really happy. Okay, 
couple of other things, a knock box. You can use your wastebasket or whatever, uh, but this is going to make it really convenient and easy to remove your spent puck after you make your coffee. Whether it's big or small, whatever works for your kitchen space. Now, this machine actually comes with a really fantastic tool called a dosing funnel. Now, this is actually going to just go straight onto our portafilter, lock it in place, and what it's going to do is it's going to help me get enough coffee dosed into my portafilter without it falling over, spilling over, and creating a mess. And it's also going to make our job of distribution really simple. I'll explain that in a second. And then last but not least, if you have a scale, highly encourage you to use one. If you can buy one eventually, go for it. I don't want you to feel like it's mandatory, but it will help with our consistency, okay? Being able to measure everything as we go will help, but you know, making coffee should be fun and exciting. And if that doesn't sound exciting to you, then don't do it. Um, the machine's gonna really take care of all that for you. And if you don't have a scale, the razor trimming tool will help you a lot. So I'll kind of help explain how to use both. Now I'm going to start with the scale. So what we're going to do is dosing funnel on the porta filter. We're going to put it on the scale. I'll place this over here and I'm going to turn on my scale. And what I want to make sure is that the scale is set to zero with my porta filter on it. So as you can see, I'm on zero. If that was not the case, then I would have just hit the T or zero uh, button to set it to zero. Cause at this point I only want to weigh the coffee going in. Now I can go to my cradle or the forks here on the grinder. Now on the LCD screen, you'll notice a couple numbers here that we really need to remember. The first one is your grind size. And then the second one is your timer for the grinder. Now the way the grinder works in this machine is it's just going to run for a set amount of time, which will then dictate how much coffee goes in the portafilter. Pretty straightforward, right? But what we don't know is how much coffee are we dosing per second, right? So we can't mathematically just figure it out. And the reason for that is every coffee has a different density to it. So it's going to pass through the grinder at a different rate. So my numbers are not going to match up with yours, most likely. So yes, great helpful reference to get started. Just know it's probably not going to match with what you need. So find a good starting point and then you can make the same incremental changes that I do in response to what you get. So this is what I'm starting with. Grind size seven, grind time 20. I'm using a medium to light roasted coffee. So it's pretty dense. So it's going to grind a little bit slower. Your timer might be at 14. So we're going to start the grinder by tapping it to the back. That smells so good. Okay, so now that the grinder is done, I can simply pull the porta filter and dosing funnel off and place it on my scale. And at this point, I'll be able to see how much coffee I have. So right now we're reading 17 grams. A really nice reference point is to aim between 18 to 22 grams of coffee for a double basket or a two cup basket. So what I'm gonna do is actually manually add just a little bit more. To do so, go onto the cradle. I'm gonna push and hold the porta filter against that button, which will manually grind. And as soon as I release, it'll stop grinding. So just a little bit more back and we're looking spot on now. So right about 19 grams, great starting point. This is a 54 millimeter basket. Anything over 19 uh, starts to become what we would consider a heavy dose. Uh, so 18 to 19 is really great for this machine. Okay, now we have the coffee dosed. Now becomes the tricky job of what we call distribution or puck preparation. Now, when I say that, all I'm trying to really get at is the <laughs> inherent fact that 
because water is going to be crashing down on this coffee so intensely, I need to do everything I can to ensure that the water spends as much time as possible with all this coffee so that I get to taste all the goodness that comes out of it. If I just tamp straight onto this, there's a decent chance that the water is going to find some channels. So channeling occurs when the water finds a path of least resistance, right? So there's a bunch of little air pockets in here because I'm grinding the coffee really fine so it gets fluffy, right? So what I want to do is try to settle that, those grinds to take up as much space as possible so that I have even density in this basket when I tamp. The easiest way to do that is keep that dosing funnel on and just simply give a couple taps against your wrist to help settle those grinds. So now I can remove the dosing funnel and you'll notice that the coffee is all settled into the basket. I no longer have a big mound. They have settled, they have taken up space, I have removed air pockets, and so now I have a pretty good chance of having even density. Now that's a really easy way to distribute without using any other tools. If you wanna use other tools, absolutely go for it. Just whatever you do, try to do it the same every time and make it really simple. Okay, now we have distributed our coffee grinds. They are dosed, ready to go. Last job is to tamp by pulling out our magnetized tamper. Now, when it comes to tamping, uh, it's really important to hold your tamp in a way that's really comfortable for you. The easiest way to remember that is to not hold it like this, like this, like this. You wanna approach it like you're gonna grab a doorknob, flashlight, anything like that. Use your index and thumb as reference points against the edge of your tamp so that you can ensure that you're coming in at your coffee perfectly perpendicular and not at an angle because you don't wanna be pushing those grinds to one side because then you're creating more density and then the water is going to stay away from that side and then you have uneven extraction. The only reason this matters is because you're putting effort into all of this, so let's make sure that you get what you deserve, okay? So holding your tamper, you're going to make sure that your forearm is also perpendicular, right? So set up your portafilter wherever on your counter that feels comfortable. Let's use a washcloth, right? We're going to protect the portafilter and our counter. And then I'm just going to, before applying any pressure, I'm going to put my tamp on the portafilter and then use my index finger and my thumb to give a little twist to ensure that I'm level, right? Once I have that, I'm just going to use my body to come up on my tiptoes and then just kind of lean over the portafilter. Now, the reason I do that is because it's easy for me to have consistent body weight than it is for me to apply the same amount of pressure with my muscles. It's also going to be more strenuous for me. So if I can just simply lean and then drop, I can do that the exact same every time. And when it comes to tamping, don't overthink how much pressure. Really just try to think, push until the coffee grinds no longer sink down any further. They've told you that they're as tamped as they can possibly be, and then do it the same every time. Now you might be tamping heavier or lighter than I am, but as long as you're the one making the coffee and doing it the same, that's all that matters. Okay, now we have a perfectly prepped puck that has been tamped, it is clean, it is ready to be brewed, okay? Now what we're going to do is transfer the coffee over to the group head at a 45 degree angle and twist until just 90 degrees. I could go further if I wanted to, but because of the gasket in here, I'm just going to go perpendicular to help save the life of that gasket. Okay, as soon as the portafilter's in, I can hit the two cup button to start brewing. And now we're going to monitor our time and look visually at our shot. We wanna see drips at around 10 seconds. Okay, we dropped right at 11. All right, and then noting how thick how fast, the color, everything. And this is all just information for us so that the more and more we brew coffee, the better we get. Just giving us context clues. 
It's, you can see the stream is starting to get really pale. We stopped at 37 seconds. Now it's important to note that this machine is a volumetric machine, meaning it's gonna automatically turn off once the set volume has passed through the group head. Now the two cup button and one cup button only dictate the amount of water that passes through. So I could have hit the one cup button and the only thing that would change is less water would pass through the same amount of coffee. So don't get stuck in this way of thinking that if this, then that, right? It's completely up to you. So if you wanted a smaller volume, more concentrated shot of espresso, feel free to hit that one cup button, even if you're using a two cup or double basket. But for the sake of a good balanced recipe, we like to look for a ratio of coffee to water. And something that's really balanced would be matching that 18 to 22 grams of coffee with two ounces of water. So that's why I hit the two cup button. But just know, tons of flexibility there. Now, it's going to automatically stop at two ounces, right? However, I want that two ounces to pass through in about 22 to 35 seconds-ish. Now, it's a big range, but just know that that's because all coffees kind of respond differently and there's no right or wrong way to pull a shot of espresso, but we can tell you scientifically what's going to pull out the best balance of flavor compounds. Where, where when we extract coffee, we're kind of hitting a sour, sweet, and bitter layering, right? So if we don't pull out all three of them, we're going to over index on one side and your espresso is gonna make you pucker or it's gonna dry out your mouth and just not taste great. So. If we can hit that range, we're more likely to have all of those compounds that we want to make something really delicious. Okay, so that pulled in 37 seconds, not a terrible shot, but a little on the slow side. So what I would do is I would change my grind setting from seven and I would actually increase my grind size, making it easier for the water to pass through a little bit quicker. So let's say I would go from grind size seven up to grind size nine. I don't recommend making more than a two to three click jump per setting, because if you make a really big grind adjustment, you might end up getting lost and chasing your tail. So small incremental changes, uh, unless it like came crashing through in five seconds, then you could make a bigger jump. But once you get within a close window of that 22 to 37 seconds, let's say, um, small changes and you'll get there a lot faster. Now, even if your shot doesn't look great to you, I still recommend trying it. It's a really great way to get to know your coffee, understand your own preferences and develop your palate. So I can taste that this coffee might've had a little bit more left in it. Um, and because it pulled so slow, I think I probably could have unlocked a little bit more by freeing up the water flow. Uh, it's not bad. I would happily drink this all day long. It actually just gets better as I continue sipping it. Okay, now that's the workflow of dialing in your coffee, right? And as soon as that's done, now you'll notice that my puck just fell out, right? Now, the reason for that is because this machine has what's called a three-way solenoid valve. So as soon as the shot is done extracting, you'll notice a sound that sounds like a like a purge, right? And what that's doing is it's sucking the water out of the puck and dispensing it into the drip tray. And what that does is it makes the puck really easy to remove. And sometimes it's so easy, it comes out before you're even ready for it. Uh, but just know that that's totally normal. Now, we always want to clean as we go, keeping our workstation nice and tidy. And that's why I like to have these rags all set up to make my life way easier. So that's coffee, but what next, right? We have the shot of espresso. This is the base of everything. This is how we make an Americano, a long black, a cappuccino, macchiato, cortado, latte. You can ice it, you can do whatever. You have all the freedom in the world but you need to make sure that your coffee tastes good. So don't just skip ahead, right? Take your time to make this taste great. And then each time you pull an espresso after that, it'll be pretty consistently ready to go.
Now I'm going to twist my machine so that now we can talk about milk. Okay. Now this machine has a 360 degree swivel on the steam wand. It's got numerous holes in the actual steam tip that really help you to get more steam pressure, uh, which is super helpful for cutting through the milk fat and making really nice silky microfoam. Now, forewarning, the technique of steaming milk manually takes some time. I've been working in coffee for over 15 years and I can tell you that it took a long time for me to really understand what I was doing, why I was doing it, and to be able to consistently get the same result. So please be patient with yourself and just know the process can be fun. Now I'm gonna grab a milk jug and some milk. Today I'm using whole milk. You don't have to. Let's say you don't want to or cannot drink dairy milk. So you're going to use oat milk, almond milk, whatever, soy milk. They're all great. The way that I would steam these is different. So if you're only steaming oat milk all day every day, you'll learn that technique and it'll stay the same. If you're switching back and forth, just know it might become frustrating because it does have a slightly different technique. Now, whole milk was kind of the default for a long time because of the fact that it just happens to have a really good blend of fats, proteins, lipids, a lot of things that happen when you're steaming milk. But the most important is the amount of fat and the types of proteins. So when we're steaming milk, we're doing two things. We're heating the milk and we're introducing air, right? We're creating a foam. So when I create my foam, I don't want to create bubbles that then just fall flat and go away. I want them to stay. So the job of the protein is by introducing heat, we're relaxing the protein and then trying to get them to surround and protect all of the air bubbles that we introduce. So there's a, there's a trick in the timing in which we introduce air before the fat dissolves in the milk because then the proteins are going to protect the fat and not the air. So this is where we really find this balance of when our bubbles stay and when our bubbles start to become really big and then fall flat. So the technique it really lies in two different areas. The timing and the position of the steam wand. So focus on two different perspectives. The first one being how deep our steam wand actually goes into our milk, right? So at first we want to submerge the tip of the steam wand just below the surface of the milk and then as soon as we turn on our steam wand, we're going to pull down on the jug so that the, the tip of the steam wand breaks the surface and pushes air into the milk. At that point, we're going to continue steaming until we get to about body temperature. And then we're going to once again, dunk our steam wand so that it stops introducing air. The other one is the perspective from above, making sure that the tip of our steam wand is not right in the middle, but slightly off to the side. Because of this, we're going to create a whirlpool and we're not just building foam on top of itself, but we're actually incorporating it and mixing it the entire time, okay? So let's see what that looks like practically. I'm always going to purge my steam wand before I start, making sure that there's no water built up. So just simply turn on your steam wand. You'll see some water come out. That's exactly what we want because we're using water that's way hotter than the water that we used for the coffee. We're brewing coffee at 200 degrees Fahrenheit and then we're making steam at 270 degrees Fahrenheit. So it takes a second. Once you see steam, turn it off, put your jug in. I like to use the spout as a pivot point so that I'm anchored and then submerge the tip of your steam wand and then go to the side, not all the way to the steam, like the jug sidewall, but just slightly off. Again, you're just creating a, a, a whirlpool. Turn on your steam wand. The tip is submerged, right? As soon as it starts kicking in, we'll pull down. And you're, you'll know you're there when you hear that sound of tearing paper. 
And you'll notice I'm not moving my jug a whole lot. I'm listening for that sound. I want to keep that sound by subtly moving your pitcher to keep it, just breaking the surface. And I'm using my fingers to say, okay, I'm at body temp. The jug is not hot or cold, so I submerge the tip. So I'm still spinning, but I'm no longer introducing air. And that timing is really key. Once you figure it out, it's actually really simple. It just takes some practice. Now you'll know you're done when your jug or your steaming pitcher is too hot to touch. As soon as you're done, wipe down your steam wand. And this is why I like to have a dedicated rag or washcloth ready to do so. Because then I'm not running around stumbling trying to get everything clean. My workflow is really consistent, makes my life easier, and it makes me want to make coffee. Okay, I'm going to use the same shot of espresso. Yes, your shot of espresso will change. Your crema will dissipate. It's just CO2. The flavor of it will not. So don't worry if you feel like your shot has been sitting for a little bit. It's not gonna kill anything. The flavor will live on. Okay, now I transferred it into a larger vessel, obviously, and I'm going to slightly tilt my jug, or my cup, sorry, and I'm going to pour at a height so that the milk goes to the bottom. Fill it about halfway up and then get as close as you can and increase your pour speed, level out your cup, and then just pull through. Not trying to do anything crazy because I want you to know that pouring latte art really is just an inherent byproduct of getting the foam and texture just right. So don't obsess about latte art if you're just getting started. Just know that it will slowly come inherently as you get the density and texture right on your cup. And that's what's most important. I want you to create something that has the drinking experience that's really silky, smooth, and has that body of texture all throughout. That is specialty third wave coffee, right? And I love using these glasses because you can actually see as the drink settles how much foam you have. And if I wanted more or less foam, my timing of how long I aerate or stretch or that, pair, that paper tearing sound, I would just shrink it or extend it by just a little bit. And then I would have more or less foam. So there you have it. Thank you, friends, so much for joining. That is how to dial in on the Barista Pro. I had a blast. I hope you learned a ton and I hope you feel really comfortable and confident to approach this machine each and every time. Thank you again for joining, and we'll see you next time. Bye.